Greetings, dear ones. I am Kryon of Magnetic Service. Again, we are here in a way that may seem strange to many. I want you to get used to hearing this voice. I want you to understand the reality that is here. You would ask yourself, human being, is this real? You might say, crying, I'm, I'm having a hard time believing. Believing that you're really channeling and the, that the voice comes from the other side of the veil is just, it's so difficult. If that's what you're saying today, human being, I will say, blessed are you. For these are honest words coming from one who is struggling to work out of the three-dimensional box. And what happens is that slowly, if you ask the right questions of your own self, of your own belief, of your own psyche, you start getting shown things you didn't expect. For if indeed it is a quantum experience on the other side of the veil, if indeed I am linearizing this conversation and presenting it to my partner, if this is true, this is a quantum experience. And that means that language is only a small part of it. That the audio that you would hear or the words that are seen on the page, such a small part of it. We have spoken of something called the third language. This third language, identified some time ago, is not a language in linearity, which is the third one. It is a language of the catalyst of the three. We use the three in numerology to represent a catalytic action number. That is to say that all of you have the ability to receive what is being given at a level which is quantum and not language, and not words on a page. Even the reader of this particular message can ask for a quantum experience and be in the session with those who are in the session. <laughs> Art and music. We've told you that they are quantum. We have told you how you could go into the Louvre and watch a painting. That you can immerse yourself so completely that you can see and feel the artist creating it. That you become one with the creator of the painting. So much is there that is not for the human eye. And this is the one who appreciates the art. Music touches your very soul. All of the notes playing together in unison in harmony. It is one of the only arts where all of that can be presented together and there's no limit to the number of musicians on a stage. But you can't do that with speech, can you? No limit to the number of colors on a palette. You, you can't do that with speech, can you? There's a little bit of quantum in everything, if you look. So look for it here before we start a message that is not going to be a quantum one filled with love necessarily, although it is. <laughs> but we're choosing to do something unusual. We're going to give you some science. We've chosen perhaps an odd place for that. But we haven't, for we think in a quantum way. We wanted to come to this place. We want to honor those who built this building. We want to honor the ancestors who are listening. We've come to a very quiet place in the stillness of a Southwest. In order to give a message of, of, of clarity, of purity, so that others 
will also receive it in that fashion. So it is not about the message at all, is it is about the delivery. It is about the energy of where you sit. It is about the preparation that we give my partner sitting in this place. And so we will. When we give a scientific message, when we give suggestions, I ask my partner to go very slow. Some of this has been revealed to him and some of it has not. I ask him to proceed slowly for it will be seen and read clearly and much will be seen around it. For what follows in this message is not just esoterics. There will be a practicality and there will be physicists looking at it. And that makes my partner nervous. It is not going to be complex. For even the one sitting in the chair who doesn't understand science will still receive what they need to receive through the third language. And will understand why these things are being given. And all through this, the entourage which is poured into this place, which represents the ancestors of all of you, resounds even with the builders of this building, of the consciousness that allowed it to be planned so many years ago. For the display of ceremonies that it has on a regular basis and what that means to the earth and the land to continue to hear the ancients giving the sounds that they have given for so long. All of this wrapped into this building, into this place where my partner gives a message of science. Not necessarily a long one, <laughs> but one which you have to hear. It's about the environment. And let us start with assurance. Let us review one more time that what you are seeing in weather changes on this planet you have not created by yourselves with human effort. <laughs> what you have called global warming is not global warming at all. And I say it again, it is part of a cycle that always was. The North Pole has melted several times and come back several times. It is a waxing and waning. The water evaporation cycle that has been here before, it is here sooner than expected and that is alarming. If you were to ask Gaia, the actual energy of Gaia right now to come into this place, Gaia would give this message, humans have not caused this. Could it be any clearer? And I give you this information so there would be no alarm sounded of things that you would have to change drastically and dramatically. Now, at the same time I would say that, I would say this, there is a mandate to change your energy. What you put into the air is significant for it is a hazard to your health. What you put into the air hurts humanity, not necessarily Gaia. Gaia is more resilient than you think. Gaia adjusts in ways you don't expect. Gaia takes care of Gaia. Clean up the air and you will live longer. And that is one of the subjects of today. It's going to get colder. That's one of the subjects of today. You're going to need more energy. That is the subject of today. And we have given you the steps of creating energy easily. And we've given you advice in the past. And one of them we wish to revisit. For it's time for you to think out of the box of three-dimensional when it comes to some of the things that we have discussed with you. You think in a straight line. You don't think past necessarily certain things that you assume. At 
the same time I give you this information, I will also tell you that this particular information is already known on the planet. It is the way of it. We do not give you something that has not already occurred to a human being. Free choice is what we have told you is the operative word, even in science. This must have occurred and a human being must have had a situation where they're actually aware before we will give you a message like this. And the reason we do it is because one human being aware sometimes could do nothing about it. But the thought is given. When these thoughts are given to humanity, they normally land on the planet in more than one place. That is to say, epiphanies of discovery happen all at once, usually three to four times, in order to assure that they will not be lost. And so I am going to add this voice. There is tremendous energy available from the earth for free. It is not free energy, for you have to build an extractor to get it. But it's everywhere, absolutely everywhere. It is called geothermal energy. And it goes like this, below your feet, not very far, not really. It's hot, hot enough for you to drill down and create steam. If you can create steam through natural process of thermal energy of the planet, you can drive turbines and create electricity. That will create heat. There are other ways to create heat as well, using even the geothermal heat itself. You're fond of steam engines, and you've been using them very, very long time, and you continue to. Today's nuclear reactors are simply very, very expensive steam engines. For you heat water, you create steam, and you drive turbines. So we are giving you something to think about. For nuclear power, as good as it is, is not clean. There is a side effect, and you know what it is. For there are waste products, which are dangerous, and you know this, as clean as it is, there is still something you have to di dispose of. Geothermal, there is no thing you have to dispose of. But it is dangerous. And now we open the discussion. If you can drill approximately five kilometers down, you will find enough heat. Now five kilometers to you is not that far in a straight line along the surface of the earth. Many of you walk that distance to school and work. It's not that far. But if you're going to drill down technically, it becomes difficult and dangerous. Not just dangerous for the driller, but dangerous for the planet. On the way down, through the crust of the earth, to the five kilometer mark, you go through pockets that you might know are there, releasing gas, perhaps, releasing fire, perhaps, releasing water, perhaps. If nothing else, sometimes you interrupt what we will call the integrity of the lubricant of the shale itself. And what I'm saying here is you might even advance the potential of an earthquake, all by drilling down only five kilometers. And so I'm going to give you the answer. And now I'm saying, think out of the box. All along, you're thinking that you're going to drill down and put a pipe with water in it. What if I told you, you, could, you only had to drill down a fraction of that of that distance, and you could find enough heat to boil. And you'd say, impossible. Oh, it exists over the hot spots of the earth, but you might know it doesn't exist in most of the places we're asking you to drill. Well, it will work if you don't use water. 
It's time to marry the highest technology that you have on the planet with things you didn't expect to marry them with. And this is thinking out of the box. This is becoming a little more quantum, seeing the entire picture instead of just seeing what you think it should be. There are solutions, and you know what they are, and they're elegant, that will boil at a fraction of the temperature that water will. And this is the answer. Learning to use those substances and those fluids and that chemistry into a geothermal machine that doesn't have to drill down five kilometers. How about two? And we tell you this because you're going to need to do this. And if you do it, and if the advice is followed, you'll find that the timing and the synchronicity of discovery is at hand. That is to say, you will understand these things will fall together. You will get the steam engine, and it won't take five years to build, and it won't be dangerous, and you don't have to cover it with a shell. Much easier. It won't belch smoke. It won't pollute. And you don't have to worry about being next to it. And it'll drive electricity. And you're going to need to heat homes and businesses. Because eventually it's going to get cold. That's number one. We're going to give you one other invention. Now this also has been presented on the planet. This has been thought of and not acted upon. This actually is not all that new. But I will tell you that there is a situation at hand where it was inappropriately purchased and pocketed. So I'm going to give it to you so that the public can see it and anyone with synchronicity who listens to the message and reads the words will understand it. Even you sitting in the chairs will understand it. And the scientists and the physicists will then have to implement it. The resource that this planet is going to need the most, as the population grows, as the weather changes, is what you probably already have guessed. Fresh water. Already it's becoming scarce. You will notice the snow is falling in the wrong place. <laughs> the reservoirs are built for the old energy with the old weather. The aqueducts are built for the old energy and the old weather and all the snow is falling in the places that are not obtainable for fresh water and that will be the way of it. As the populations grow, scarce it becomes and there is one answer. It is a profound way when the earth is mostly water <laughs> to use the sea and the ocean. The ocean, of course, is not fresh water. And so you have to ask how to extract the salt. Desalinization exists today in a very inefficient way. Large amounts of water have to go into vats of containment and sit there. Or large amounts of energy are used to heat the water. In various ways, various attributes, various systems, some of them steam, some of them not, all requiring heat to take out the salt. It takes a long time. It's expensive. It's not efficient. It is not tenable to desalinate for an entire city. Only in places that simply have no fresh water at all is it used. So inefficient is it. Now I'm asking you to think out of the box and I'm going to give you the answer. My partner, I want you to go slow here. Most of the cities on earth, of all of the countries on earth, the largest ones are on the coasts near the water. This is because over time 
those coastal areas were the places where trade could happen with ships and ports. And so you end up with the largest cities being on the ocean. It's a good place to start, is it not? To give water for them from the source which they can simply look at and use. The answer is not that difficult, but it requires something that has not been thought of, really. The highest technology you have today has to do with the smallest of the small. You call it nanotechnology. That which is extremely small, even taking form as, as what you would call robots, that could be in, inserted even into the bloodstream, perhaps even to to seek out and kill disease. That's how small the nanoparticles are. You're making them intelligent through chemistry, through logic, through electronics. And cleverly, you find that they can do many things. Now I'm going to give you a task. You're going to build a desalinization plant where the water never stops flowing where it can be treated and salt can be removed and a byproduct created that you had no idea about. It never has to rest. It never has to be cooked. There is no heat involved at all. It goes in one end and comes out the other in a steady flow. In one end it's salty, in the other end it's fresh, ready then for purification. And here is the answer. Through nanotechnology, in the first stages of the system with the water flowing, you release enough nanotechnology robots that are assigned to find the salt and attach themselves to it. Except there is a caveat, and that every single robot is magnetic. I am the magnetic master, after all. All of the salt then becomes magnetic. It's not that hard. You have the chemistry for it. You have the nanotechnology. Think out of the box. Think out of the box. Chemist, physicist, you can do it. On to the next stage, flowing into the next part. Tremendous, huge electromagnetics. Pulling the salt out of the water completely and totally because the salt is magnetic. Out it goes. Oversimplified, perhaps. But this is the way of it. No heat involved. Now, the byproduct? You won't believe it. Oh, and it will be controversial when you discover it. Magnetic fields applied to water often creates water that is quite healing. Do you see where this is going? What a device that might be. It will be quantum, you know, because it uses magnetics. And this is what we wanted to give you today. This is what we wanted to have recorded today. In this way, that you might hear it. There is so much more. And just in closing, I will tell you what we see in the future, and we're not going to give you a time frame, for there is none. This information I'm about to give you can be two generations away, maybe three. But it all has to do with quantum invention. Physicists, listen, I'm going to give you something you already know is possible. It is another field of science. It flies in the face of everything three-dimensional you've ever learned. Humans are funny. Even in the highest math and geometry you have, everything is defined in a straight line. Everything defined in a straight line. A circle is an infinite number of straight lines. <laughs> That's funny. It's almost as though a circle didn't exist in nature. 
And the human has to straight line it for it to exist. Interesting, isn't it? I'm just giving you the bias. Bubbles have always been around. They're beautiful, you know. They're natural, you know. The circle is a natural occurring event in space as well. What you don't know, and you may suspect, gravity and magnetism all bend. They don't go straight. They never have. What about light? It doesn't either, when affected by the other two. That ought to tell you something. Nothing is really a straight line at all. The only straight lines around are in the brains of the humans. <laughs> You're not using the right kind of math either, and we've told you that. There is an elegance of math that is quantum. And if I begin to tell you about it, even in the simplest terms, it's going to seem overly complex. Quantum math uses something that is going to be discovered, and we're going to give it a name, and that's going to be influential numbers. Numbers that exist not with empirical values, but with values that are influenced by the numbers around them. Four is not a four. Four is modified because of the numbers that sit next to it. In a formula, in linearity, in counting, each time a formula is manufactured in a quantum state, looking for a solution, all of the numbers are modified by the numbers next to them. They're influential numbers. The four is affected by the five. Reduced maybe by the three. And in quantum math, if you use influential numbers, dear ones, it is a beautiful thing when you find out the attributes of them and they are consistent. You will then have the formula for a circle being a whole number, not an irrational number at all. It won't be pi. It'll be pi solved. We ask the physicists to work it backwards if you have to, to get a whole number of pi. That'll give you a hint at what has to be done. Imagine mathematics with influential numbers, where each number is not empirical, but influenced by the one around it. I'm giving you high math now. And here's how it's going to serve you. Because when you start to understand it, you're finally going to understand what I'm going to call the holy grail of physics. <laughs> That's a human term. In your straight line thinking, in your bias, you have all of your 3D formulas, don't you? And when you look at the basis of physics, you talk about those things which have mass. And in those things which have mass, you've even figured out atomic structure and density. All those things. And you think they're static, don't you? You think there is a formula that is for everything. If it has so much mass, it weighs so much in a certain atmosphere, a certain gravity. You've got it all figured out. And I will tell you that all of those formulas are 3D. And as soon as you become quantum with them, they all stretch. All this to tell you this, it is possible for you to alter the mass of any object in existence. It doesn't matter how large or small or dense it is. You can alter the mass of it. And you have thought all this time that the formula is static, and it is not. In Yugoslavia, there's a workshop. Historic it is for the man who thought out of the box.
Tesla. And in that workshop there are marks on the ceiling for the objects that took off on his workbench and went straight up. Shattered they did, hitting the ceiling they did. Nikolai was frustrated for he had discovered massless objects and didn't know how. He thought out of the box, the only one in existence to ever give you a thought of how alternating current might work. Oh, it's more than 3D, study it. The same applies with numbers. The same applies with mass. And I will tell you that it is accomplished through magnetics. Always has been. And that was the experiment. In Tesla's time, without a computer, without any of the finite instruments you have today to measure what you have, he did it. But he couldn't control it. Frustrated he was. By the way, he's back. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you where. Maybe he will listen to this and know what to do next. Clever it is how magnetic fields must be arranged around other magnetic fields. Even solutions that are magnetized to create fields within fields, sometimes at right angles, sometimes not, to give you a condition that will create a change in mass. None of these things are out of the purview of human development. How long it'll take? We don't know. That's up to you. But do you understand what it will change? That means that the things of science fiction are finally yours. What you call anti-gravity is simply an object without mass. It'll float, no matter how big. It's doable. It's in all of your science fiction movies. Maybe it's time to implement it. Cry, and why do you give us these things? And with this we close. <laughs> we want you to stay here. Give it in love. We want you to stay here. And you're not going to have much luck with that unless you start thinking quantum. Unless you start accelerating the inventions and put some of the politics out of the way. For the countries which must do this are the ones that have the highest technical abilities. And they also have the highest influential structures that are in the way of it all. It is time for the population to understand this and turn the physicists loose and not strap them with those things that are difficult with burdens. And maybe you don't know what I speak of, but they do. Because we want you to stay. In the process there will be life extension, in the process there will be epiphanies, in the process you might even find that this message was accurate and true, and then you've got a puzzle, don't you? Physicist, if you're listening to this, you've got a puzzle, because who is it who is speaking from the other side of the veil, giving you information that is true and real and scientific? At some level you're going to have to, you're going to, have to say, it's, it's the piece of you. At some level, you're going to have to admit that the spiritual and the sciences have lied. And that the creative energy that created the earth and the magnetics and the gravity and all of the things you study is a piece of you. And maybe then you'll open up. And the things that you wish to have invented, all you have to do is open the box because you already were there and you helped in their creation. How about that one? 
It all has to do with the puzzle. Is this real or not? Is cryon real or not? Is love real or not? Well, some of you know, because you've sat in the presence of the Creator today, who loves you, this family on my side of the veil, loves you. It's a wonderful Valentine message, isn't it? And so we say to you, dear ones, all of you, that all of the things that we talk about, whether they're scientific, whether they have to do with your akash or your soul, the higher self, all of those things, there's only one purpose. To make the life you are living on this planet easier. For you to discover the compassion that is the glue that puts you together, that changes the earth itself, for the shift is upon you. And that which you call the 2012 energy is here. Let this be what it is supposed to be. A high time of consciousness, of scientific evolution with integrity, with an economy that is a re-emerging one with integrity, with government that slowly changes with integrity. Things that you would never put together that in the past were oxymorons, <laughs> couldn't exist together, integrity and government, integrity and insurance, integrity with banking. All of these things, a new paradigm is upon you. This shift is difficult. And we have the warrior and the worker in the chairs in front of me. And they know it. Because that's why they came. I know who you are. And I celebrate each. Each one. And so it is.